Continuing on in Acts chapter 16, and what we're doing are, are case studies in conversion. Um, one of the things that I, I love about the Word of God is that when you look at it, you find people that are a lot like us. Uh, oftentimes the, the pastor or a, a church has a failure to really look at the entirety of Scripture and the diversity of people that are involved in it. And when we begin to see it in all of its complexity and all of its unity and all of its glory, we find a lot of ourselves in the stories of Scripture. Uh, that's what I, I love about it. Growing up, I, it, it, it didn't seem like the time where I would hear pastors, they would explain things, and it seemed like when they, because of their fear of showing uh, people or talking about people in sin, they would talk about sin in a very kind of minor way. And, and what I mean by that is, is that it would seem like those people really didn't struggle that much when they talk of stories about people. I don't know if you've ever had that. People that, it's like they struggled, but it was never the struggles that you had. Uh, I, I remember for myself, there was all these sins that I was struggling with when I was in high school, and I'd come in and I'd hear the service, and I'd hear them talk about people, and I'm like, wow, those people must have halos. I cannot relate to them at all. I, I, I don't understand them. I don't get them. I don't know what they're dealing with, because it seems like he's talking a language that I, I, it's not applicable to me, because I'm really messed up then. And I remember when I first read uh, uh, Augustine's Confessions, who is a, one of the men known as our church fathers from Carthage, Africa, that I really find someone that I could relate to that struggled with sins like I struggled with. And what I love about the scripture is that really the stories of struggles and conversions of people uh, are found throughout its pages, and they really are people just like us. When you really examine it, when you really stare into their lives and you explore their backgrounds, you're like, wow, they're people just like you and me with all kinds of issues and all kinds of backgrounds. And in Acts chapter 16, really this whole chapter, when we, when we consider the two stories that we're looking at today in the case of this slave girl, this slamen slave demonized girl and this Philippian jailer, and when you couple that with a story we heard last week with Lydia, who was a businesswoman, we get pretty interesting case studies of how they came to faith in Jesus, and we see that there's not a one-size-fits-all, um, that they're, they're, their stories are different, their backgrounds are different, how they came to know Jesus are different, that Lydia is a businesswoman from Thyatira who'd converted to Judaism and she's out by the water and she, God opens her heart to hear Paul expound on the word of God and she's converted. But then we explore this slave girl who, who is uh, demonized and yet she is miraculously freed as she comes to faith in Christ through this power encounter. And then we see this Philippian jailer who's really a, a soldier who doesn't really care about any type of religious things or care about people just doing his duty. And we see him come to faith in Christ in a pretty phenomenal way too. So my hope today as we explore this passage, as we delve into it, as we see the complexity of these characters that we really find parts of ourselves that we might be drawn to them and that we might receive encouragement not only that God can work in our lives and transform us, but that he can use us to share his word because many of us may not think of ourselves as great evangelists. Uh, we, might, we might not feel like we have great words or we can't do this ministry or that ministry. God may not be calling you to that. He's calling you to use what you have and to trust in him and let you, him guide you to share with people so that they too might be saved through the gifts that you have. So today, we're going to explore these case studies. Now, if you're not familiar with case studies, uh, allow me to tell you that uh, years ago, I would find myself in different classes where I was learning about counseling or I was learning about handling different issues, and the teachers would give us these case studies or stories of people going through different things that we would sit and we would talk through about uh, how to solve their particular issue. So we have these case studies that are showing us how these people were converted and the response of, of uh, those around them in their sphere of influence, how they responded to their conversion, and how we might, when we come to faith in Christ, have to deal with similar people like that, uh, and how we are to carry ourselves as we continue to embody and go forth doing what God has called us to do as we are on mission for Christ. So let's take a moment to pray and ask God to bless our time that we might truly see who they are and in the process also see who greater who God is and who we are as well. Let's, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we do come before you today asking you to open wide the word of God into our hearts so we might be changed. We might find courage, encouragement, strength, uh, that we might be able to come to you knowing that you will receive us, but yet for those who have been truly changed by the very grace of our Lord Jesus, that they might go forth boldly knowing that you are working in ways that we cannot begin to understand or comprehend, but we trust that you're working. So Lord, speak to us today and draw us unto yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's jump within our passage. Hopefully you have a Bible that you can follow along with me. If not, just listen in as we walk through this text. We start in verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, this is Paul, Silas, uh, and and his team, uh, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. I was talking about a demon. Spirits and demons are often used synonymously or terms that are used back and forth with one another. She has a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. And so she is uh, telling the future and she is getting money for it. She's pretty good at it. And she's a young girl. We, uh, the, the term there used, means a maiden. She's not yet a woman. So she's probably, um, you know, we, we, it could be a range of age, but I'm guessing between 13 and, and below, but enough to be able to walk around, articulate. Uh, but she's a young girl. And we were met by this lady who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So this first case study is a demonized Gentile slave girl who had been oppressed and victimized. We aren't told uh, how she came to be demonized, by the way. Um, We don't talk often about demons in the West, but for those that come from majority world cultures, this is where you live. Demons are every part of every conversation. And and many think that demons are for that part of the world and not for this part of the world. I think that demons are possibly more engaged here than there. They're just much more subtle. And how they've permeated our culture, our thoughts, how they've got into our education, uh, how they've lulled us to sleep with the carbon monoxide of pleasure and all of the different ideas of pursuits of how we are to live, how we are to uh, achieve different things. I mean, it's infiltrated all of our culture, these demonic forces. And so we have a girl here who is demonized. Now, demons can take uh, or come into a person and control in a variety of different ways. We're not told here how. Uh, It could be that uh, she had, uh, I mean, demons can come in through habitual sin where we continue to sin again and again and again and we're not repentant. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen The Lord of the Rings, but uh, there's the ring that they have that when they put it on, they enter into this dark world. Basically, when you're putting on sin, you're being exposed in a greater way to the evil one. It's opening up doors and windows of your house before you go to bed at night and asking the devil to come in. So it can be through habitual sin. Uh, It also can be through practices in the occult playing with Ouija boards, astrology, witchcraft, uh, or witch doctors. Um, It could be in a variety of different new age or pagan ways or practices, some disguised as exercises or meditations or all of these different things that they are at its root and its origin, demonic practices that are meant to open one up to powerful forces. And it could have been through that. It could have been a generational sin or a demon that had been with a parent or a grandparent or a near relative that once that relative passes away, it goes to that uh, son or daughter. It could be in a variety of different ways. And we in the West are not as educated with demonology because we're afraid if we talk about it, we got to deal with it. But here, you see an instance of a woman who is clearly demonized. And in our culture, we have a difficulty because we recognize that not everyone is, uh, would we think that might be demonized, it could be a mental disorder. It could be an emotional issue. Or it could be vice versa. Uh, A good friend of mine that I met when I was in India is a professor at Harvard University. And as uh, he is, works at the largest privately held psychiatric hospital in Boston. 
and I talked with him and I said, help me out, I need to understand where does the mental, emotional end and the spiritual begin that you're not medicating people but they're actually demonized. He said, it's really hard to tell the difference. And so for many of us, we kind of pull back but we have here, this girl is clearly demonized. She's a slave girl, she's been oppressed, she's been exploited, she has been used for other people's gain, and we see here that she is following these, Paul and his team around, and she is talking about uh, God. Now this girl has uh, a a divine type of, or uh, some type of clairvoyance or insight into the future. Now some would say, well demons don't have that. No, demons do have some limited supernatural powers and insight. We get this in Mark chapter 5 where we hear about this demoniac who is walking around naked among the tombs. He's crying out and day and night he's cutting himself and he's tearing chains away that none could hold him because he had a supernatural strength that came with it. They do have insight. They have the ability to mimic some of the miracles of God too. We see this in the book of Exodus where you have Moses commissioned by God to go forth and do these miracles by his staff through his brother Aaron to show Pharaoh that God is a God of the miraculous. In the first few instances where he does this, we see that Pharaoh has his pagan Egyptian priests or magicians that we are told three times that they do the same thing by their magic arts. So for example, Moses takes his staff and lays it down before Pharaoh, and if you're familiar with the story, it turns to a serpent. And then these pagan priests, known as Jan- Janus and Jambres, come, they drop their staffs, and it turns to snakes, but I love it, Moses' snake swallows theirs shows that God is more powerful. And then we see it again, where Moses, uh, Moses tells Aaron, take my staff, touch the Nile, it turns to blood. They come and do the same thing by their magic arts. And then he, he goes again to the Nile and you know, casts the, the, the staff over it, and all the frogs come out and cover the land. And they do the same thing by their magic arts. But then, The next time what happens is that he touches the dust of the ground to become gnats that cover man and beast, and it says that they can't do it by their magic arts. Matter of fact, we read this in Exodus. It says that the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not, so there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So we see here that demons do have some aspect of power. And remember, the devil at one time was part of God's people and at his angelic host, and he was helping lead people in praise. And we know in 2 Corinthians that he masquerades as an angel of light and can on a limited basis imitate the miraculous. And so here, this woman is given a strength, an insight, a power. We don't know how accurate she was, but we know that she made money. She was good enough to make money for her employers. And we see here that she is walking around and she's following Paul and his team going, these men are proclaiming the salvation of God. Now, as a, looking at that, we're like, well, that doesn't seem so bad. What's wrong with that? I mean, what she's saying is truth. What's wrong with that? It could be a variety of things that they got annoyed with. It might be that she just kept doing it day after day. Have you ever had someone whistle a tune or sing a song over and over and over and over and over and over again and it gets so annoying? Uh, My son, Josiah, who's four and a half, heard this song. I don't know where he heard it. And at first it was like, oh, it's so sweet. And it's called Share the Love. And he walks around and he plays with stuff and he's like, share the love, share. And the problem is, is he does it all the time. He never stops. Legos, share the love. After a while, I'm like, stop sharing the love. I can't take it anymore. (laughs) This is driving me bonkers. And he's like, I'm like, no, you can share the love, but not that love. I just, please, just shut up, please. (laughs) Okay, because you're just exasperated. And, And it could be that they're annoyed hearing her do it again and again and again. Or maybe it's because they didn't want people to think that she was with them in this ministry. 
that they all knew she was this fortune teller and maybe he thought they were united together or maybe she was doing it sarcastically or maybe she was doing it and it was bringing unnecessary attention to the ministry where they were drawn to the miraculous but not the Messiah. It could be a variety of different reasons but we don't know exactly. We know that Paul gets annoyed and he says in the name of Jesus Christ I command you to come out of her and it says that she was delivered at that very hour. Now what can we learn about this and why has God laid this out in his word for us? Well, there's a few things. First of all, the gospel of Jesus Christ touches so many different lives, but here we see that it delivers the demonic. That there are some people that you look at that freak you out, that are so black and dirty and and, and enslaved and they terrify you. There's so much evil in them. But we see here that, that Christ, the gospel, delivers the worst of the worst, that, it can, that there is no demon that has more power than Jesus. One of the stories that I absolutely love is when that demoniac who had that supernatural power, who's naked, who's crying out day and night in the cemetery, sees Jesus, runs to him, and you'd get ready to brace for this attack, and he casts him out, and, and, and he realizes that it's not just one demon, that it's a legion of demons. And they're terrified of Jesus. Terrified of him. They say, please, please. Don't torment us before the time. They know the prophecies of the word of God. They know what's going to happen at the end of time. And they know that there in their face is the son of God. And they're terrified. We read about this throughout the scriptures. Like in the book of Mark, we see this in various passages where you have him saying, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Or we see it again in various passages in Luke chapter 4, verse 40 through 41. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had been sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And also demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God, be to rebuke them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. He didn't want people coming just for the miraculous. He wanted them to have the true Messiah. And then again, we read about this in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, where it says, you believe that God is one, which was the hallmark, which was the motto, which was the essence of Judaism, the great Shema, that God is one. There's not many gods, there's just one God. But it said, even the demons have correct theology, and they shudder, because they know how powerful he is. So we see here that the gospel delivers the demonic. And here's what I want to explore with that, that it transforms the enslaved and the exploited. That this girl had been exploited, she'd been victimized. You can think of what we just heard last week with Catherine Raja and these men who were, uh, and brought men and women who were using these young girls and exploiting them for their own financial gain. And this woman had been enslaved. She'd been enslaved, I mean, not only spiritually, physically, socially, emotionally, psychologically, everything as she'd been enslaved, but Jesus came in and transformed everything. Because that's what the gospel does. It transforms you at every level. And there are some that are here, you're enslaved. It might be demonic or it might just be your sin, but when Christ comes in, he sets you free. And when the Son has set you free, you are free Indeed. And that's huge that you don't have to keep doing that sin anymore. You don't have to keep going back to porn. You don't have to keep going back to that relationship. You don't have to keep lying and stealing and being greedy and going after all these things in the world. That he saves and transforms the enslaved and the exploited, even when it's the demonic that gives them that power. That's how powerful the gospel of of Jesus Christ is. Saves the exploited and and the enslaved. And she's walking around exclaiming a truth, but she didn't believe it. And so he even saves and transforms these unredeemed truth exclaimers. And here's what I mean by that when I say unredeemed truth exclaimers is that there are people that have the understanding or the right theology and they talk about Jesus, but they themselves are not redeemed. They say the right things, but they don't do the right things. That's why Jesus laid out within his word in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
So he's saying that you can say all the right stuff. And I think there are so many, even in our own church, that you can say the right things. You can give the right theology. You can give the right answer. You can go to conferences. You can serve in church. But you're still not redeemed. And so just by saying things doesn't mean you are saved. The hallmark of a true believer in Jesus is obedience which is shown and expressed in repentance and yielding and surrender. That's my question for you. You might take the right notes, you might say the right things, but you know in your heart that you don't know Jesus. But God wants to transform you. He wants to transform unredeemed truth, exclaimers. And how does he do that? It happens through a powerful encounter with God. See, there are some people that are so stubborn that they don't get it through the exposition of the word like Lydia did. They don't get it through the conduct or what's going on with the disciples in the earthquake like the Philippian jailer, that they have to be delivered. And I hope that's not you. But I hope it is. Meaning you don't go out and look for the powerful encounter, but I pray that God meets you powerfully and shows his power that he's the one that can free that he's the one that can deliver. And maybe you need someone to pray with you, someone to talk to, someone to confess to, someone that can truly see what's going on in your life and help you determine whether or not you have Christ in your life or maybe some demonic influence that you didn't realize. But this woman is transformed after a powerful encounter with God. There are some here who do need that power encounter with the Almighty to wake them up to who he really is. Some have been walking around, playing with God, offering up half-hearted, weak obedience, but really could care less about him. You might call yourself religious, exclaim truths of Jesus, but are unredeemed. I pray that God shows himself to you today, and that you don't leave this place until you are delivered. Now I want to focus on what happens after this woman comes to faith in Christ, because there is a collateral issue that arises because of her coming to faith in Christ. Well, I'm sure Paul and his team were rejoicing in her salvation and her silence. There were others who were not so enthusiastic. Let's pick it up in verse 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Now, what can we learn from this? First of all, when Christ comes into your life, as he did with a slave girl, it disenfranchised them. It took them out of business. It took it away. That's what the gospel does. It transforms people in such a way that those around them who have taken advantage of them, who have exploited them, are left high and dry. In other words, that's what uh, happens is the gospel disenfranchises the demeaning. That's what happens. It changes. It, it overflows to other people where she can't be exploited anymore. She can't be used anymore. And that, some people don't want that. They, it's hurting them. And these men were disgusting. They were users and abusers. See, that's what Satan does. He uses people. They were exploiting this girl for their own gain. The same can be said from traffickers that we heard about last week who were exploiting girls sexually. The same also goes to pornography. It's exploiting people, many of them young women who have been coerced into porn or deceived into it. If you're going after porn, know that you're exploiting those who are enslaved. It's no different. The same with drug dealers or the abortionist that they are playing on people and they are making money off of death and disruption and the destruction of people. When people are changed, others who have made money off that evil are out of jobs. And know, and know that they won't just sit back and let it happen. These guys grab Paul and his team, drag them to the Agora or the marketplace, which was the center of social life and where the magistrates or, or community leaders would be conducting business. A whole crowd would have been around and they begin to accuse Paul and his team of disturbing the peace and promoting anti-Roman laws or customs. And look at verse 20. When they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. And they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. See, when Christ comes into a person, a neighborhood or culture, unbelievers may deploy various strategies against us as the name of Christ goes forward. See, they were exploiting these young women, this young woman, and they also accuse them now of advocating for customs that Romans couldn't or wasn't legal for them to do. And the devil tries to manipulate us in various ways, whether using law or culture. 
uh, against us being overt in his intimidation or subtly manipulating us through movies, websites, education, the arts, sports, other entertainments. He's working to silence us, to make us look silly or against the culture. He will do whatever he can to shut us up or intimidate us into silence. Now look what happens next in verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments of them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. They stripped them off, have them beaten. They're trying to inflict shame on them. They're trying to shame them. Nudity, public nudity, uh, was considered a shameful act. Uh, There's a time when King David's soldiers go to these men to try to make an appeasement uh, with them to support this new administration, and they think that they're trying to scope out and they're spies, and so they shave off half their beards, and then they trim off their their backs of their their pants, uh, their trousers, to expose their buttockses to completely humiliate and shame them. And so it's interesting to know how shame and nudity are tied together, that in the book of Genesis, that Adam and Eve are walking around uh, naked, and it's not a big deal, but yet when they sin, they realize they're naked, and they have to close themselves of their shame. But it's also fascinating to know that Jesus, on the cross, what was he? He was stripped of his garments. He was shamed naked, taking our place and our shame that we might be clothed. But here, they're using shame as a weapon in order to intimidate them into silence, to bring shame on their family, to show those who would follow that this is what's going to happen to you as well. Making an example of those trying to snuff this out before it gets rolling and gets really moving. They want to nip it in the bud, all because their desire is to silence them, and there are those who still wish to silence us. They want us to shut up, to be so intimidated, to think of all the legal ramifications that we could be sued, that we could lose our job, that we could be hurt, that we could be harmed. It's pretty incredible to think about. I read this story just yesterday of a man who was ministering in a Midwestern city in 1957. He was doing youth ministry when he encountered this girl who was 14 years old. She was beautiful, but she came from a completely broken home. And she came to faith in Christ and he was discipling her and she comes to him one day and she says, I need you to know that there's this huge pressure on me right now. There's a local gang in the area that is pressuring me to be a prostitute so I can go sleep with these wealthy guys in the suburbs. But I don't want to do it. I have no desire to do it. And he's like, cling to the word of God. Do what God wants you to do and you'll be okay. And yet he left for the summer, he came back three months later, and then when he did, he couldn't find this girl in the youth ministry any longer. He inquired of the different youth that were there and said, what did happen to this girl? And they said, she's left us, we think she's gone into prostitution. So he tracked her down, went to her house, she opened the door, when she saw him, she went into tears. She said, I've become a whore. And he said, why didn't you resist? Why didn't you go? He goes, well, first of all, they threatened to beat my father. And I resisted, so they beat him and put him in the hospital. And then they threatened to gang rape, I mean, beat my brother. And they did, when I refused, they beat him. And then they threatened to gang rape my mother, and I knew they would. So what could I do? So I I, I agreed to become one of their prostitutes. And he said, "Why, why didn't you go to the authorities? Why didn't you go to the police and tell them and they would protect you? She goes, who do you think that gang is? found out they were the very policemen themselves that were exploiting this girl and doing all these things to them. And they were trying to silence. They were trying to manipulate. And we're going to have people try to do the same to us, try to get us to turn away from Christ, to make us compromise, to force us into situations that are going to, to, to really threaten our faith and humiliate us and shame us and hurt us and harm us. But we have to continue to be faithful. We have to pray for those around us. We have to battle together to realize the complexities that people face are huge. And we need to come alongside one another and feel those who are feeling those pressures to protect and also to look for justice, not for that person, but within society as well. And so that's going to be in an attempt to silence us. So we see them trying to, that the gospel does disenfranchise the demeaning, but the demeaning will fight back. And we see here that they are beaten, that they are taken into, thrown into prison. I mean, they are stripped naked. They're beaten with rods. I mean, I'm sure they're they're beaten. They're hurt. They're bloody. Um, And then they had inflicted many blows upon them. In verse 23, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks, shut the door, went to bed. 
Now these guys are bleeding, they're bruised, it's pitch black, they're sitting in there, and rather than go, hey, I'm innocent! Hey, this is what is going on. Why am I in here? Why am I suffering? They don't do that. They're having a worship service. And it says here that it says that they are about midnight. So it's, it's late. It's black in there. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I mean, they probably don't get much entertainment. And guys coming in, not crying out for justice, but calling out to God, probably, you know, would totally awaken their attention what are these guys saying? Why, why aren't they crying? Why aren't they? I came in here and I was a mess. What's going on with these guys? And it says, and suddenly, in verse 26, there was an earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and every bonds were unfastened. And I'm sure those guys were like, hallelujah! woo Free at last! They're excited, ready to go out. But then we see that the jailer comes running. He wakes up, says when the, the jailer woke, verse 27, saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now why? This is an honor-shame society. This was a man of duty, that his job was to keep those prisoners, and Roman law, because he's Roman, dictated that if a soldier were to lose those under his care, his watch, that they would be killed or executed. And a jailer, much, much worse. And so he knew he was gonna be public humiliated. He wants to save face, his honor, because he failed, the only way to save honor is to take his life. Something very foreign to us in a Western context, but he's trying to preserve in his honor in society, that's all he has. He's a man of duty, he is a soldier, and he's like, I failed in my duty. He gets ready to take his life, to stab himself. When Paul cries out, no, we're okay, don't do that. Now what can we learn from this? This whole story, it's this. It's that God disrupts the dutiful. That God takes those, that person who doesn't care about the things of God, he doesn't care about the scripture, he doesn't care about the supernatural, he cares about doing his job, he cares about just going through, I mean, he's going through the motions, he's not a theologian, he's not really a, a bad guy, but he just cares about soul, being a soldier. And yet, God awakens the dutiful and disrupts them in their life and shows his love for them and meets him where he's at in his world. And how does he do that? He does that, first of all, through the conduct of these men. They're in there singing, they're in there worshiping. I'm sure he heard that before he went to bed. And then though, to come back and see that they should have run, any other prisoner would have run, and they don't. Why? Because they're filled with compassion for him. So he, he's disrupted by their conduct. I mean, the earthquake probably helped quite a bit too. But you have their, I mean, he's, he's awoken by their conduct and their compassion. They're not, Paul's like, no, 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 don't do it. We're not leaving. We're not going anywhere. Anybody else would have because they're saying we care about you. We care about you. So he disrupts the dutiful and he does that through our conduct and our compassion and that results in phenomenal change. See, when Christ comes into a life, he transforms that life from the inside out. That he takes that person and he, he gives them new desires, a new way of doing things, a new way of living. And look what happens in verse 33 with this Philippian jailer. And he took them that same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. He didn't wash their wounds before. He didn't care. They were prisoners. But now, suddenly he cares. So he goes and cleans them up. They've been beating, bloodied, um, hurt. He's, he's buying them up. Then what happens? He's baptized. Look at verse 30, uh, the second part of verse 33 washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his, all his family. Then he brought them up into his house, not in the jail, and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with the entire household that he believed in God. So he, take care, he takes care of these men. They'd been dirty, wounded. He cleaned their wounds. Then he was baptized. If you truly believe, then you should be baptized. Stop delaying it. I can't tell you how many people that I encounter are like, well, I'm waiting for my husband or my wife or my son or my daughter or I'm not ready yet. If you believe, you can't, and you think, well, maybe I need to get my life cleaned up first. That's not how it works. You don't. You, that's like saying, here, I need to take a bath before I get into the shower. It doesn't work that way. You come in dirty. 
And it's showing a commitment, not that I have all my life together, but that I'm willing to yield and follow him and he's gonna take this hot mess and he's gonna transform it, but I believe and I wanna show my belief. You need to be baptized. Jesus told us to. It's a public identification with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection that you are saying to the whole world, I am following Jesus. That's what it means. It doesn't save you. It doesn't literally wash your sins away. It's saying that I'm partaking in his death, burial, and his resurrection. You need to be baptized. What is preventing you from being baptized? And look, not only does he get baptized, he, it overflows to his family. They're hearing the word of God. He's sharing it with them right away. And they believe. And they get baptized. And then he's now hospitable. He's opening up to them. He's saying, come into my house. I want you to come out of prison. I'm opening up my home to you. You were from a different culture, a different background. And you, I'm a, I'm a Roman. I was a, I'm a jailer, but you're the prisoner. But yeah, come on in. That's a tremendous thing to show, to bring him in. It, re, it results in phenomenal change. So here's my question for you. Is your life been changed? Can you see those things in your life? Those evidences of God's grace and his power? needs to result in phenomenal change. So they bed down for the night, and in verse 40, 35, the magistrates and the police, the next morning to free Paul and his team, their suffering was enough for the night, and they could go in peace. Paul would have none of it. And in verse 37, we read this, and I'm gonna walk through these really quick. But Paul said to them, they've, been be they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and, they, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. Let them be shamed. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens because to beat a Roman citizen without trial, you were in serious, serious trouble. And you could be beat or penalized yourself. And so it says they came and apologized to them. Uh, and it was a shameful thing for them to apologize, I mean, to come out like that, to admit it. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of this prison and visited Lydia and her little house church that's been set up that we just read about her conversion just a few passages earlier. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, what can we learn from this? As we go about sharing the gospel and on mission for Christ to expand his kingdom in the world, we're going to need discernment for direction discernment for direction. I'm going to go through these really quick. Why does that matter? Because we know that through many tribulations we may enter the kingdom of God and that we are to endure suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. But here Paul, after suffering in the face of being freed, draws on his rights as a Roman citizen and in our society there's a lesson for us. We need to know when to exercise our rights to benefit the kingdom of God. To exercise our rights as American citizens. We need to be able to do that. Paul sees, uh, uses his citizenship. Why? He didn't want them to think they could get off so freely. It was not legal to use certain forms of punishment against Roman citizens without trial, and that's what these guys had done. And so they treated Paul and his team shamefully without going through any legal form, uh, legal procedure, thus violating Roman law and getting themselves into all kinds of problems that often resulted in severely punishable repercussions. Now, as American citizens, we have certain rights within our society that we can use to our advantage to show forth the gospel to reduce hostility to Christ, to utilize for the protection of others, for the protection or proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it is to protect the unborn, the foreigner, to stop violence, racism, or the abuse of the most vulnerable among us. We have a powerful tool at our disposal that we're to use to propagate the gospel. And there are times that by our suffering in the face of hostility, even when our rights are being violated, we have the opportunity to expose the powers that be. See, we get to show how sinful they really are. When we stand for Christ and we entrust ourselves to him, willing to endure great abuse and shame, we're showing that Christ is Christ's rule and that they are corrupt, which results in greater ministry for the name of Christ. Now, if we have the ability to exercise our rights, then we do so, but we need direction. God may want us to utilize them or he may not, but whatever the case may be, we need to know how to endure suffering well. Yesterday, I had the opportunity of being interviewed by... Uh, um, uh, Nick Dwyer, uh, Darlene's son, who was a senior at Moody Bible Institute on suffering. And he wanted to know what our theology of suffering was as a church. And it was great to be able to say, we understand that. That's part of the gospel. We've proclaimed that several different times here, that we're to endure suffering well so that Christ might be seen in us. Without complaining, looking to Jesus, knowing that our suffering is not in vain, but has a point to it, and that one day all will be revealed. 
But in the interim, we know that he's going to use our suffering to turn people to him. So we had two case studies of conversion, and when we when added to Lydia, we see that there are three stories of people coming from different backgrounds, shown Christ in different ways, but all who come to know him are changed because of it. The question that I have is, what's your story? Perhaps yours will be today. A story of how you came to know Jesus, and it will be because of theirs. The question that I have for us is, do we believe? How is a person saved? How can you be saved? By believing in Jesus and what he did on the cross. He died on the cross for your sins and mine, was buried on the third day, rose again, and then 40 days after that, he ascended into heaven where he sits at God's right hand and waits for the day to come, when, the day to come when he will come again and when all of creation will be placed under his manifest reign. You believe by placing your faith in him and that is expressed by turning from your sins, receiving him as the proper king and Lord of your life. The question is, is do you believe? If you reject him, then you'll have to pay for your sins on your own for all eternity and hell is for you. But if you believe, then you receive him and all he has to offer, but it must be by faith. And believing in this gift of salvation and, and the ceasefire that he has declared for us, he has offered to us through his son an act that cannot be earned as we read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. You have to receive you believe and receive all that he has done, knowing that it is for you, not for someone else, not for that person that you think is so far off, not for that person you think is far away, but for you personally, that God has given it to you. And he's asking you, have you believed and received and entered into that life just like they did? Have you believed and received? You can do so today. It's pretty simple. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Call on him. Say, Lord, save me. Turn from your sins and then tell someone about it as you embrace him as Lord of your life and receive him as Lord and Savior and as you learn to live in this new Christian walk and this life that he has for you. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and all that you've done. We thank you that how you're working in our lives and through the lives of these, your people. We thank you that you your gospel delivers the demonic, that it disenfranchises uh, the diseased and the difficult and the demeaning, and that it also transforms. Lord, it disrupts the dutiful. So Lord, please disrupt our lives, bring us into a greater understanding of who you are, and help us to extend forth the word of life, offering freely the gift of salvation that has been enabled to us to receive because of what Christ has done on the cross and achieved and shown by his resurrection. Lord, I pray today that you save, and that person who is feeling that conviction might say clearly, Lord, I believe, and I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. Save me and transform me. And Lord, may they enter into that new reality as you make them into a new creation today by faith. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just to remind you that we have our time with Muhammad Yamat tonight, I would heavily, heavily, heavily encourage you to come out for that. Uh, he will be a tremendous blessing. It'll be a great opportunity to hear, to be encouraged and challenged for your own context to share the truth of Jesus. I think we all need a good evangelism challenge before us to go forth and sharing the good news of Jesus, and I'm sure that he will do that.